All right. Okay, everyone, pretty excited. Um, so this is the first lecture of the Gridspace IAP series on speech and language technology. Um, so uh, really excited to have everyone here. Uh, and this is what we're gonna do today. So we're gonna start with a course overview. So for those that don't know what we're trying to do with this, what this series is for, we have actually four new interns starting today. So this is gonna be their Gridspace 101 as well. Um, and we're going to go through kind of what we're trying to achieve with this series. Um, then uh, today we're going to be focused on the kind of basics, the physics of sound, acoustics, uh, perception of sound or psychoacoustics, uh, microphones and recording, and then a little bit on voice and phonetics. And um, so first things first, let's talk about like what this series is. Um, we, we're going to be posting these on YouTube later, so maybe you're watching months later or maybe you're following along live as we do this. Uh, first things first, is there anyone who's on who wants to introduce themselves or no pressure if you don't? All right, well, I'm going to introduce myself and I'm going to introduce Gridspace. So um, my name is Anthony Scuderi. I'm co-founder of Gridspace, co-head of engineering. Uh, we are a speech and language machine learning technology company. Uh, we work on long form conversational speech. And um, this course is uh is kind of our solution to the number of requests we get uh recruiting in mit to provide some sort of iap internship uh for the one month long iap period in january we don't have one month long internships but we thought it would be kind of cool if we did a kind of grid space crash course that could be a bridge to future work at grid space we also thought this could double as a good grid space crash course for folks that are starting today we had four people start today as well i keep pointing to you francis but because you're the closest. Um, all right. So we could just make this the course. Uh, just use transformers for everything. Thanks, everybody. Let's go home. Um, but I think that if you actually want to do stuff that's deep and is creative and significant in this field, understanding of the fundament fundamentals is really important. And also understanding how to apply things in the real world is, is important. Uh, choice of model is probably the uh, easiest thing you, you might need to do in that whole process, depending on what type of speech or language problem you're working on. So this is where we're headed. We're, we're focused not on singular models, but teaching you how to build integrated systems that deploy machine learning for signal processing, speech recognition, language understanding, emotion recognition, uh, as well as language generation, speech synthesis, and all of this in the messy real world, not in the uh, the simple contained world of you know validation sets uh this is kind of a cartoon of what it looks like if you do over the cell phone network a call talking to a bot where you have speech recognition followed by a dialogue system followed by speech synthesis and through the internet and through a phone network and phone towers all the way back through your you know sound waves your brain being interpreted by a person and then back to speech recognition and to show you where we're going um sophia who's not here today uh, put together a demo, so I'm going to have to do it on her behalf. Uh, this is a dialogue system that she wrote uh, a couple days ago that is for people who are deciding whether to do this course. So um, I'm going to throw it on the speaker here. Hello. Thank you for calling Group Faces IAP Question Answering Hotline. My name is Grace. Can I help you with? Hey, um, I'm an MIT freshman who's majoring in linguistics, but I'm also maybe thinking about computer science. Is this course right for me? Absolutely. The IP program is perfect for teaching fallback. It's designed to introduce the basics of natural language processing and analog systems, image learning, and perception. So you'll get a great overview of the field regardless of your prior knowledge. Plus, there's no prerequisites, so you can jump right in. Okay. Um, now, it's raining today, uh, and I'm a little concerned we'll get canceled because of rain. No worries. The IAP program is held virtually, so you can participate from the comfort of your home, ring, or a shine. Okay, awesome. Well, thanks, Grace. Have a great day. All right. Well, how about for Grace? Um, 
So the idea is to learn a lot of the parts that build up a system like that. Um, but uh, first, let's talk about what we, what we want to do in this class. So we want to cover a breadth of spoken language topics uh, that would be beyond what you typically see in an intro to ML class. This isn't like an intro to ML class um, or what you would see in an intro to NLP class, but rather get a, give a broader background of the fundamentals all the way up to real world applications. So we're going to talk about sound. We're going to talk about signal processing. We're going to talk about linguistics in the context of different parts of machine learning. Um, we're going to talk about large ling uh, language models and real world deployments. Um, and uh, there's going to be something for every everyone. Limited assumed knowledge. There's going to be some parts that if you can't, if you don't get that part, don't worry about it. Just keep going. This is not a real course. This is a series of talks that we're posting in, uh, you know, externally that we're also doing internally. And just enjoy it. Get, get out of it what you want. We are going to have weekly projects. So we have uh, a coding assignment each week for the next four weeks uh, that Phoebe has put together. Um, and there's also going to be daily challenge questions that we'll answer at the next lecture. Um, and that way, even if you're following along on YouTube years later, there's some way for you to get engaged. Um, Prux, um, so we want you to be excited about ML and speech. Uh, some programming knowledge, there's going to be some programming stuff in here. Um, and then some familiarity with some of the mathematical language of ML and common ML techniques will help with understanding some of it. <clears throat> All right, so here's the course schedule. Um, I, I know Phoebe sent this out uh, to folks and is on the website. I'm going to walk through it uh, quickly. So the first week is focused on fundamentals of sound and signals. The second week is kind of on language and NLP. The third week is the pillars of speech technology. And the last week is focused on real world applications. So today is January 9th, uh, 2023, if you're watching much later. And so today we're talking about sound and acoustics. And then later this week, uh, Phoebe is going to be talking about signal processing and information theory. Um, and then uh, we'll be covering uh, machine learning and JAX. Uh, Uche is doing that on Thursday. And um, you'll see some of the lectures are, uh, are on Thursday and some of them are on Friday. That's because Good Space is off every second Friday. And so um, the, the second week is going to be a uh, walk through simultaneously parts of NLP and parts of linguistics uh, kind of hand in hand. So we'll be talking about morphology and words, followed by syntax, semantics, embeddings, lexers, and then finally uh, language modeling. Uh, the third week, we're going to be talking about just, like I said, the pillars of speech, uh, speech technology. So speech recognition or speech to text, text to speech or speech synthesis, and then dialogue systems or pods. And then the final week, We'll be focused on some more applied topics, stuff that you would definitely not get in a uh, normal uh, course. Okay, so staff and admin. Um, so I, uh, the, I'm not the lead of this course. Uh, Phoebe Piercy is. She's uh, traveling back. I don't know if you're on Phoebe, but um, uh, she's traveling back from Europe today. But she will be back for the second talk, which she's giving. Uh, she's an MIT alum, unlike me. Um, and if you need help with the course or you're trying to like you want to, you have a friend who wants to join on it or you're having trouble getting the invites or whatever, uh, don't hesitate to reach out to IAP at gridspace.com. Even if after the course is over, we'll keep this email address active. Um, we are uh, if you're going to get an invite, you should have already uh, executed a video release just basically saying you're OK with us recording you. Uh, we are going to be posting these on YouTube so that other people can enjoy them in the future or so that if you guys miss one, you can catch up. Uh, we're not going to be posting them necessarily immediately, uh, but that way you can keep up if you miss a, a talk. Um, we also are going to be trying to get some videos of good projects. Uh, so if people like nail a project, we'll try to get some of that on video as well. And um, so there's some folks that are here in person and some folks remote. Shouldn't matter. This is just a kind of series of talks. Um, but any of you are welcome to come physically to our office if you're in Los Angeles. Uh, so, yeah, I think we we'll cover the structure of 12 lectures over four units, daily challenge questions, four projects, opportunity to present your work, wide expand of topics. That's kind of the idea. All right. First, the basics. All right. So this is what I'm assigned to do. I think Phoebe uh, wanted me to cover that without. Um, but sound. Uh, anyone here know what sound is? All right, cool. So I don't need to cover it. Uh, so Let's, um, we're, there's going to be a lot of physics and math in this particular part of this particular lecture. Um, I want this to be inviting to everybody, and if you don't get all of it, that's fine. The reason I think it's important is if you really have a good fit um, or a good mental fit for how sound works, almost everything follows from just a couple of really basic laws, which is essentially the sound as a wave and sound as a gas um, or pressure waves in gas. So. Kinetic theory of gases, maybe you remember from high school chemistry, is the most basic model of a gas. 
Um, I, I sent out to the uh, mailing list, uh, if you haven't checked it out already, this really great interactive web application that walks through through you through the science of sound. It covers a lot of uh, really good stuff similar to what I'm covering today, um, probably in some ways. I'm, I'm not gonna, I was gonna maybe open it up, but I wanna keep things on schedule. But the kinetic theory of gases is this very simple gas model that most of the time is good enough. And for you, in terms of understanding sound, it's, it's good enough for the most part. So the, the rules are gas is made of little tiny infinitesimal particles. There are many, many, many particles. So you don't need to track individual particles. They have like a continuum. Uh, they're constantly colliding with the walls and each other. There's no forces at a distance between particles. Only when they collide do they interact with each other. And then finally, collisions are elastic. So there's no energy loss in these collisions. Not that there'd be that many places for it to go. Um, and the result is the ideal gas law, which you probably remember from, from high school as well. Um, and I know a lot of physics people here too. So maybe you remember it from StatMech. But um, this is a very famous law in physics and basically just says that the pressure and volume multiplied together go as the temperature plus some constants and the number of particles. Uh, sometimes, sometimes it's written in a way in terms of density instead of number of moles. Uh, but the idea is um, that, that this relationship holds in most gases. Um, all right. So you Many of you maybe have not seen this before. Has anyone here taken partial differential equations or seen a wave equation before? A couple of you. Um, okay, you guys have taken PDEs, really? Okay, cool. You did it in high school. Okay, like it, like in a back alley. All right. <laughs> um, all right. Well, so the wave equation is probably one of the two most common partial differential equations. But don't let that scare you. This is just basically saying that. Um, the second derivative or kind of the average of time changes goes as some constant, which is the speed of the wave or speed of sound times the average or, or, or uh, second derivative with respect to, to distance. And um, pretty much every type of wave, whether it's light or sound, uh, has some wave equation that looks like this. The only thing that really different is maybe uh, what's being disturbed and this uh, constant here. And so our first goal that is going to allow us to derive everything we need to know about sound, you know, a lot of which at a much more qualitative level comes from, we need to try to get to something that looks like this. If we get to something that looks like this, we can understand um, pressure waves uh, like, like a, any other wave, like light. Um, so first thing you need to understand, and this is the most mathy part, if you wanna glaze over, it's fine, but I think it's really important for those that, uh, you know, will get something out of this, to see where sound comes from, because you're not gonna really see this even in many, um, physics classes. Um, so this is from that uh, JavaScript tutorial, which covers it really well. But this is what a sound wave looks like. There's rare uh, factions where there's limited uh, pressure. And then there's these compression waves where there's higher pressure. And so we're going to consider um, in this diagram, this little um, bit of fluid traveling to the right. And the idea is it's, it's a little compression wave where it's been compressed from B to B prime. And it's been expanded from D to D prime. And this little bit of compression um, we're calling chi. And so the idea is chi is a tiny displacement of air passing pressure waves. Uh, S is the uh, area uh, of the fluid passing through this little tube. Um, and then X is along the direction of travel, including these little delta Xs that you can see here. All right, I'm going to try to walk through this as, as best as I can, but you can always talk to me after if you want to understand it better. Um, so we have a differential change in volume as the wave passes. So volume plus a differential change in volume. And then you have this volume, which is the surface area times this differential change in distance. And then there's this little perturbation. Um, and uh, so there's something called the bulk modulus. If you remember from physics, the spring constant, how springy something is. The bulk modulus is the volumetric version of that. It's a linear relationship between volume changes and pressure. So um, we are going to say a little change in pressure uh, goes as the opposite, so it's in reaction to um, the bulk modulus times a, a little change in volume relative to the absolute volume. And then so we combine one and two, and uh, this lets us express changes in volume instead of a linear change in pressure. And uh, the more springing the fluid, the more the pressure changes with displacement. So the idea here is that pressure uh, is going to uh, go up as there's more compression in this little sound wave. And it's going to go up if it's a uh, less springy, more rigid fluid, uh, like, for instance, if there's higher pressure, uh, but we'll see. 
So sound waves, um, we, we, we need to go through uh, looking at the dynamics. And so we're going to just start with Newton's third law, F equals MA. So the force is equal to the pressure times the area. Uh, you know, pressure is pressure or force per unit area. And that's going to get us the force. And then differentially, we can basically look at a pressure, a pressure waves of a DX size and rewrite this like this. So we're just basically adding this differential. But we're really just saying uh, uh, we're just really just expressing the force here with this differential. And acceleration can be written in terms of this little perturbation, which is the second derivative of time. And then mass is just the density rho times this little volume. And so if we put this together, um, rewritten, this is basically rewritten Newton's third law, we get this. Um, and we've just substituted in the last two uh, expressions, or equated them rather. And then we can remove the uh, dx and s that are on both sides here and simplify this. So now we're saying uh, the change in pressure with respect to distance is equal to the density times the second derivative with respect to the change of this little perturbation. And uh, if we combine three and four, so this one with the bulk modulus and this one with the density, uh, we end up getting something that looks like a wave equation. So we have a second derivative of something with respect to time, in this case, a little displacement. Uh, times uh, the bulk modulus divided by the density of the fluid, and then the second derivative with respect to um, distance of this perturbation. And so um, it, we, we have two things we want to do. One is it'd be nice if we had a version of this in terms of pressure, as uh, normally we think about sound as a pressure wave. So to do this, uh, well, all we have to do is differentiate three um, with respect to x. Where is it? Is one. And... Um, and then we need to differentiate five with respect to time twice. And we end up getting something that looks like this. And you can check this later or walk through it with me later. I'm going fast, but um, I'm trying to go through it step by step. Um, and so now we have a pressure wave equation, which basically looks the same with the same speed of sound, which makes sense. Um, and by comparison, you can see that the speed of sound is gonna be the square root of this expression. Uh, so now our remaining problem is by just comparison here. Uh, the main problem is like who knows what the bulk modulus of the fluid is. It's not really something that people commonly talk about. So what I, I want to want to do as our last step is put this in terms of real stuff like pressure, te temperature, density, so that I can get the speed of sound and and start thinking about sound a little more qualitatively again. And so K, the bulk modulus, remember, is the change in pressure for a change in volume. So it's like the spring constant um, for for volumetric changes. And if things are really adiabatic, where, where basically things happened really, really quick and there was no thermal transfer, we could just use the ideal gas law with the rules we saw earlier. Turns out, most of the time, uh, it's a little more complicated than that. Um, if you ever see a pressure wave like from an airplane or like a shock wave, you'll see it's definitely not an adiabatic process. What that means in physics terms is that it generates a lot of entropy and that there is exchange of, of thermal uh, of thermal energy. And so instead, this is called the equation of state when it isn't an ideal gas. Uh, this is includes here what's called the um, specific heat ratio. So it's the, the ratio of the specific heats at constant pressure and constant volume of that gas. For air, it's about 1.4. And if you study statistical mechanics, you can find that this has to do with the number of degrees of freedom in, in each of the um, uh, molecules and how much they occur. But you don't need to care about that. All we need to do is look at this, which is that pressure times uh, volume to this power 1.4 is a constant for air. And um, if we take the log of this and then take a differentiate uh, and then differentiate it, we can end up solving for what k is, and and k is just uh, is just um, uh, is just this here. It's just the um, the ratio of the um, specific heats, which is 1.4 times the pressure, and then the density. These are all things that we know about air, so we can actually calculate. Um, oh, yeah. So, yeah, I think one thing I wanted to say before we moved on to speed of sound is pretty much the reason I just did this, and this is the most boring part of the talk, I promise. Uh, well, I don't promise that, but I think it is, uh, is that nearly all properties of sound can be derived from this wave equation. So uh, vibration of mechanical systems like drums or strings are also wave equations. They're not wave equations on air. They're wave equations on a string or on a, on a, on a mechanical system uh, that then couple the air. Um, and then propagation of sound wave through, through air, reflection, refraction, diffraction, everything that we're going to talk about the rest of this talk comes from that one equation and really just comes from knowing that it is a wave, that waves propagate through space at a fixed speed, and that they do things like refract, refract and reflect, just like light. 
And so you can borrow a lot of your intuition about light because it's the same equation. Uh, there are other types of waves as well. Um, and um, everything else uh, in this lecture comes from other people who have solved this PDE. Um, although it's a really good exercise to write a, a PDE solver uh, with JAX or TensorFlow or an ML library. Uh, it's a very straightforward thing to do. All right, so the speed of sound. Um, speed of sound is 43 meters per second. It is uh, 1,200 kilometers an hour. It's 1,100 feet per second. It's 767 miles per hour. This is obviously, you can tell, not always the case because it's dependent on pressure and density. And if you use you know, the ideal gas law, it can also be dependent on temperature. And um, uh, so temperature changes the speed of sound, which will come up later, as is pressure and um, density. So you need to be thinking about what the actual atmospheric conditions are um, when you're actually calculating the real speed of sound. All right, um, Kevin is going to do a demonstration. He's going to have a drink. Thank you. So, what is he? What's he holding, guys? This, it's no trick question. What's he holding? Bottle. Bottle. Bottle opener. He's holding a Helmholtz oscillator. Um, this, this, this is kind of the hello world of um, mechanical systems that are often you might look at for starting to model various acoustic systems. And we'll talk a little bit more in a second about how mechanical systems and acoustic systems relate. But this is, I think, a really good way to just think about how a lot of uh, acoustic systems work, even if they aren't Helmholtz oscillators. Uh, by the way, fun fact, Helmholtz oscillators is one of the biggest risks when you're uh, making a uh, solid rocket booster that might cause it to explode or a liquid rocket booster. Uh, so is it, is it if you drink enough to make it make it sound? Here, come by the microphone. I think you have to drink a little bit more. Sure, sure, sure. <laughs> uh, drink enough? Is it working? <laughs> Can I drink a little bit more? <laughs> Sorry, we both have COVID, so it's fine. All right, so as he drinks more, it's getting lower. lower. So what's happening is this bottle to me looks like this. I see a volume of air, and then I see a little volume of air. Or what I really see is a compressible volume of air, and then a little incompressible mass of air, which looks a lot like this. And remember, we just talked about air has a bulk modulus, which you can also think of as a spring constant. And so if you just solve this equation where you calculate the mass of this little bit of air, and you calculate the spring constant from the bulk modulus that we just covered, you get this which is the frequency of the Helmholtz oscillator. And you can see as this um, volume grows, um, the frequency will go down by one over the square root of that volume. So try it now. <laughs> You're good at it. Yeah. Um, so that's a, that's a Helmholtz oscillator. I think it's a, it, not every acoustic system is a Helmholtz oscillator, but it's actually not the worst model for things like the larynx, which is going to be really important to us when we start talking about speech, which is all we're going to talk about. All right, couple oscillators. Uh, the reason I'm talking about couple oscillators is, oh yeah, standing All right. Um, is uh, rarely are you listening to the thing that initially generated the sound. Or what I mean is, if you play a guitar, you are not listening directly to the guitar, there's normally a sequence of coupled oscillating systems before it hits your ear. At the very least, there's typically something that mechanically vibrates that couples mechanically to the air and then vibrates the air. And so, and then oftentimes it's actually more complicated than that. So on a guitar, um, uh, you might have a string that is really, really quiet. If you, like if I took this electric guitar, which is not an acoustic guitar, and just played the string with no amplification, it'll be barely audible. Um, what happens in an acoustic guitar is a string vibrates the uh, soundboard, and then the soundboard vibrates the air in the cavity, which then uh, 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 which then uh, goes out through the sound hole. And so you have mechanical amplification of the sound through coupled oscillators. You're basically coupling uh, something with a really flat response, meaning that whether you're putting in a low E or a high C or on your guitar or whatever, um, it, it, the, the baseboard will respond mechanically and then transfer that to, to a big volume of air, which acts as a, as a mechanical amplifier. Um, uh, and um, this is generally most mechanical systems that we're going to talk about in a minute all start typically with some sort of mechanical vibration. There are uh, um, exceptions like a clarinet or flute 
uh, or a pipe organ, um, are we really are just starting with a column of fluid, kind of like a Helmholtz oscillator. Um, so types of mechanical oscillators, uh, oh, sorry, one last thing. Um, when you look at the coupling between the input of a vibrating system and the output of the new vibrating system, typically the ratio of the response is called the transfer function. If you studied ordinary differential equations, it'll be familiar, or if you studied uh, DSP, and this will probably come up again with Phoebe to, uh, next lecture. Um, and so, all right, types of vibrating system, yeah, go ahead. Why is the clarinet different? Because is it, is, it, is it a reeded instrument or like? Um, yeah, so the question is, why are clarin the clarinets different? It's, uh, it's really just because, well, actually, clarinets, in that case, the reed is really the first thing that's vibrating. So, um, but I really re was referring to it because it's a column of air that's vibrating. So when you calculate the frequency of a clarinet note, you're going to be looking at a vibrating column of air. That's the main thing that's vibrating. But there, there's even in that case, you're actually starting with a stream of air that's vibrating a reed which then is moving a column of air. But if you look like a flute, for instance, there's a flutter of air over the mouthpiece, which is then moving a column of air. And the column of air's length or effective length is dependent on like, how many holes are open. And then like a, 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 like a brass instrument, is it, what is this, like lips, I guess, or? So column of air, yeah, for everybody asking about brass instruments. And yeah, and I got, I got a picture, but I'm not, I will like, probably show more. But yeah, a couple other types of oscillators that might be generating sound, simple harmonic oscillators, linear oscillators, um, and again, Fun fact, even like our hello world of oscillators is not actually a linear oscillator. Um, actually, um, I, I first met John because of his visualizations of double pendula on, uh, on Twitter. Um, but uh, yeah, it, this is not actually a linear oscillator. It is linearized, like everything in physics. Uh, elastic oscillator, like we just saw. Um, strings, so uh, strings are a really common type of instrument. can't be on YouTube. Um, but uh, so uh, like I said, um, strings are really quiet. They have a tiny little surface area. So if you want to vibrate sound, you're going to need to mechanically couple them to something else uh, or, or, uh, or amplification. Uh, membranes and drum heads. So like your ear. Here's the lowest frequency vibrational pattern in a circular membrane. This circular membrane is a piece of. And uh, those are a really interesting system. Here's the lowest frequency vibrational pattern. All right, uh, bars oscillating, so like vibraphones or xylophones um, or chimes, uh, and those those um, mechanically vibrate when you strike them. Uh, then pipes, so columns of air that have different lengths, and the, um, the column of air actually is a wave that is twice as long as the tube most commonly. Um, and these different types of vibrating systems, depending on the geometry of the object, the materials, the linearity of the materials, um, other imperfections, cause them to actually have imperfect spectrum or where they will have harmonics and off harmonics that we collectively call timbre. And so that's why the, um, why the sound of like a uh, tuning fork, which has a really pure sign-like tone, sounds very different than like a guitar playing the same note. Um, all right, strings and modes. So um, the wave equation, if you solve it um, with boundary conditions that it, where you can't vibrate at the end. So you can't vibrate here. You can't vibrate here. Uh, does anyone remember what that type of boundary condition is called? Dirichlet? Or is it anyone? Cole? I don't know. No one knows. But um, uh, when, when you strike it, there are different solutions to that equation, right? So any equation, as long as it's still um, in both first derivative and in displacement at the edges, then it is a solution to the wave equation for that string. And in the case of the wave equation for string, uh, it's actually the density and tension of the string that matters for the, the frequency. So if I play like an E, It sounds like an E, but if I if I really carefully, although I'll do a high E here, maybe it's a little easier to hear, right at the center, right at the very middle, I'm going to try to mostly engage that first or fundamental mode of the E. It sounds very sinusoidal versus if I engage the string really close to the edge where only really high harmonics uh, are going to compose that initial perturbation. It sounds a lot, it sounds different. The timbre has changed because the composition of harmonics is different. 
Um, so I'll just do it again here. And you know, this is often you know exploited. You can also play harmonics directly um, and directly engage with them. And um, those are just different solutions to the same wave equation, but for a string. And in this case, in this case, there is no mechanical uh, coupling to the sound directly. Uh, pickups on a on an electric guitar are actually measuring an electrical signal that we're then turning into a sound at the, at the amp. But um, but understanding harmonics and the fact that different vibrating systems have different distributions of harmonics and that makes them sound different is really important to understanding everything from voice to why instruments sound different. Um, and you can visualize these. So th actually, the modern way to do this is with a laser. Uh, but these patterns, so this is on a drum head here. Uh, these are known as what? And to listen to him. So he's putting sand on it. And the idea here is that if you are on the edge of a node, um, it doesn't move. It only moves between the nodes. And so this is a great way to visualize nodes on two-dimensional systems like drum heads. And so what he's going to do is he's going to turn on the sound. I'm on the 100 zone, as I call it out. So we turn it on. Most is going to be where? On the outside where the salt is. Now watch what happens when I start increasing. Feel free, once again, to show your appreciation and initiate experience. As soon as this starts getting boring, we stop it. Oh, 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 oh. The first time I saw this, I just... I couldn't believe I actually get paid to do this sort of thing. <laughs> Once again, where is it not vibrating? Where there's no salt. Where there's no salt. Oh, there is salt. Oh, so it's vibrating there. And, and you can actually, see, if you solve that, you can so solve these equations for like a square vibrating membrane by hand, actually. And these are just the solutions to essentially harmonics on two or three D systems. Um, and they're these really, really complicated patterns that form. Um, and these really complicated patterns. If you actually look at the uh, like the uh, the modes of or the nodes of a drum uh, head or a guitar uh, board, or in this case, these guitar shaped modes uh, that um, cause really interesting sounds. That's why instruments sound so unique. All right. Oh, yeah. So here's the modes of a drum head, or some of them, you know, infinite number. Um, and you can see because it's a two dimensional system, there's two free indices that define the, the, the nodes for a 3D system. Um, you know, there'd be three. I don't know any where that's the case. All right. That brings us away from sound into the world of acoustics and psychoacoustics. Any questions so far, by the way? Anyone, anyone remote want to ask anything? No? All right. All right. Acoustics and psychoacoustics. So resonance, this is, this is a really complicated form of resonance where you have many metronomes. Um, but when you have coupled systems, um, oscillating systems tend to drive other oscillating systems uh, to either um, exchange energy because they share some overlap in uh, resonance or some overlap in, in, in uh, modes that they can, they can vibrate in. In case of these metronomes, uh, they're driving each other in a really complicated system. And so when you have lots of oscillating systems like that, you can actually have really, really crazy synchronization phenomena. But even two vibrating systems, we often talk about sympathetic vibrations. That just basically means one vibrating system is able to exchange energy with another vibrating system. They might not have the exact same resonant frequencies, but they're close enough within what's called the quality factor um, of the two systems. 
so that they can cause each other to vibrate. If you have, uh, this is commonly demonstrated, I don't have tuning forks. If you have two tuning forks on the same frequency, uh, one can excite the other if one's vibrating and the other isn't because they have the same resonant frequency. And in this case, um, these complex systems can have massive levels of synchronization, just exchanging little bits of wiggling through the, uh, the platform that they're on. Uh, pressure and power. So intensity uh, is is defined for sound as the power per unit area of a sound wave. So it's the pressure per unit area. Um, and intensity and power uh, both are, sorry, both grow as the pressure squared. And so remember the wave we're thinking of as a pressure wave. So if the pressure doubles, then the intensity, which is is, is related to how we perceive it, as well as the power, uh, grows that squared. Um, Sound, like a lot of other free waves in space, obeys the inverse square law, which basically says that as you get further away from things, the intensity, or so the uh, so the sorry, the energy and power die off as one over the the uh, the distance squared. So if you get twice as far from something, it's going to be uh, four times quieter in perceived power. Um, we often, when we talk about loudness, though, we don't talk about the absolute intensity. We typically talk about uh, decibel. So this is a, this is a decibel meter. We have a bunch of them, and so right now it's about forty six decibels in here. Except when I talk, and now from here it's like it's like seventy six or something. And um, we perceive um, intensity logarithmically, and uh, we often use deci decibels. A bell is basically the log of relative value. So if the rel if if the intensity doubles, um, then the log of two would be a bell, uh, or it would be a log of two bells. Um, and um, a decibel is 10 times a bell. And this is often used so the number's a little bigger. So you're talking about 76 and seven, instead of 7.6. Um, for sound power, the reference typically used is 10 to the minus 12 watts. And so if it's a one watt speaker, then the log base 10 of uh, 10 to the minus 12 is going to be, um, or one divided, or 10, 10 to the 12 will be the number of decibels. And so um, uh, this is the formula for that. Um, what happens if you double the number of sources? So same, double the decibels. What happens to the decibels? I don't know. I mean, if there's is there's a saxophone a meter from me, and then another saxophone a meter from me, how much louder is it than one saxophone a meter from me? No, so they it's cancel each other out. It's du it's double. It's yeah. Well, actually, if they play just right, we'll get to that. Uh, yeah, it's it's going to be basically um, the uh, log of two uh, times ten. So that's going to be a relative number of decibels. So was that three point three? Decibels different. Um, decibel scale. So this is this is actually really important to understanding what a decibel is. So um, the human ear does not respond uniformly across different uh, frequencies, and so uh, but the decibel scale. When I just say, "Oh, a jet engine is 100 decibels" or whatever, um, I'm not. What am I referring to it relatively to? And um, and actually, typically, there's different decibel scales. Uh, decibel A, B, and C that have um, different response rates to different frequencies. Um, a is the most common. So um, uh, when I turn this thing on, it's on decibel A mode by default. Um, I don't even know if you can change it to another scale. You probably can. Um, yeah, but um, yeah, decibel A is the most common. Uh, and you can notice that like a very loud, low frequency um, sound is not nearly as shrill as these high frequencies. Um, signal to noise ratio is also really important to intelligibility. That is basically the power of the signal, which is the thing you care about, divided by the, the power of the noise. So for instance, this room uh, right now, you can hear me hopefully reasonably well. It has a very, very loud air conditioner. When the air conditioner is on, my signal to noise ratio goes way down. Um, and that's often, again, presented in decibels. So you might think about that as the log of the power of the signal minus the log of the power of the noise. Uh, this often matters more for intelligibility than anything, not just for people, for, but for speech recognition. Um, so a, a, uh, the signal to noise ratio is really important. Every single conversation that grid space processes, we measure or we try to measure the SNR. 
All right. Um, last time I did this talk, this was people's favorite part. Um, so hopefully it's it's good again. But this is the ear. Um, and there's a lot of the ear is really complicated. Um, but basically, here's the outer ear, which is basically acting as a uh, form of mechanical uh, amplification. And um, when the sound goes in, it eventually hits the uh, tympanic membrane, which then there's a series of three bones that act like a three bar linkage to again, mechanically amplify that sound and send it in something called the oval window, uh, which then sends it into the cochlea, which is an Archimedean spiral of uh, mechanical sound sensors that are little hairs called cilia. So if we look at the um, real quick, we zoom in these bones, uh, you can see it's actually another form of mechanical amplification, just like a guitar, where you have, uh, sorry, the eardrum is then pushing one bone and then another and then another, and they're getting smaller and then pushing on a small area. So it just works like a hydraulic uh, a hydraulic pump, uh, where a, uh, a small pressure is turned into a high pressure. So it's mechanical amplification. And then when it gets into the cochlea, the cochlea, again, is an Archimedean spiral where it's getting narrower and narrower as it spins in. And the sound actually goes in here and then back out to the round window uh, at the end. And so um, what's happening is that in Archimedean spiral, the, the lengths are logarithmically distributed, which means that the lengths of the hair are logarithmically distributed, which means that the distribution of frequencies that we can hear are logarithmically distrib distributed, which is why we perceive frequencies logarithmically, because that's how they're laid out geometrically in the cochlea. And, um, and so just like we perceive intensity logarithmically, which um, actually we'll see in a minute, it's true about most stimulus. We also are essentially doing a spectrum analysis. This is basically doing an FFT of the signal by having lots of little hairs with slightly different lengths from really long to really short that resonate at different frequencies. So they're just a bunch of little tuning forks that vibrate um, at, a, at different frequencies. Uh, binaural hearing. So um, actually, before I show this, who, who wants to guess how, how, how you can localize sounds? Francis? Uh, based off of the intensity from each ear. OK, so like intensity is, 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 is one thing you could look at, maybe. Um, put the shape of your ear. The shape of the ear, maybe that's another option. Any other option? There's, there's a phase, time of arrival and phase. That's another option. So we have masking, the shape of the ear, and then we have uh, time of arrival, and then we have relative intensity. So it turns out it's really dependent on the frequency, and you can really easily test this. So for really high frequency, um, uh, for really high frequency uh, sound, um, uh, it doesn't diffract well around your head. And so um, high frequency sound just basically leaves a shadow. And so in addition to just relative intensity and time of arrival that uh, affects all sound, uh, sound shadowing is actually a really big part of the effect as well, the, the head blocking the sound. Um, additionally, um, for low frequency sounds, uh, time of arrival um, and phase are much more important. It's a lot easier to measure the phase difference too which your brain is able to do. Um, and um, so it turns out that uh, binaural hearing um, is very dependent on the frequency. And in particular, these high frequencies and low frequencies, um, the actual shape of your ear is um, partly designed so that you can tell up and down. Because even though you can't necessarily get the time of arrival might be the same along that, and the phase might be the same, and the intensity might be the same, you can still tell up and down a little bit. And the reason is because the transfer function of your ear is dependent on the height of the sound source. And so especially if something is moving up and down. The thing is, that's a really hard thing to capture with a microphone because a microphone doesn't have a shape of an ear on it. Except we do have this fancy binaural microphone for a, a project. Um, you guys have ever seen me. And this type of microphone actually uh, tries to replicate <laughs> the ear. Uh, it's called a binaural microphone. And uh, this allows you to actually really naturally replicate even uh, binaural uh, sounds that are above or below you. Um, again, of course, these aren't your ears, but it does work well enough uh, that it sounds really creepy. Go on YouTube and search for binaural recording. There's uh, even some channels where people like walk along the street uh, with these microphones, um, or you can hook that microphone up to headphones and try it yourself. It's really, really cool. Um, so psychoacoustics is the um, field of how we perceive sound and how that maybe differs from the exact physics. 
So we talked about intensity is perceived logarithmically. So it's really good we use decimals. Uh, we also perceive frequency logarithmically um, because uh, of the, the Archimedean spiral of the cochlea. Um, although it's not like the exact way that we perceive frequencies relative to each other is cultural too. Um, most Western cultures use uh, the stretched octave, and this is a cultural uh, um, a cultural artifact of how pianos are tuned, where an octave is slightly larger than doubling the frequency. And so, if you actually do like exact octaves, it will start to sound increasingly flat. Um, uh, is that right? Or increasingly sharp? I think. Um, and then um, perception of intensity is also frequency dependent, though. So like we saw earlier with the decibel scale, it, it weights higher frequencies more. And I think everyone can agree that like high shrill sounds sound louder. Um, and then there's other, other factors that matter too, to look at. Uh, but there's a more general law just in neuroscience, uh, Fechner's law, that perception of almost all stimulus is logarithmic. And even if you've like in writing a neural network have used like a lot of our activation functions also have that property, whether you're inverting the sigmoid or, or tanch, also get this kind of logarithmic-esque saturation. Um, uh, but yeah, that's true about almost every stimulus, including like brightness. Um, so I said other factors actually affect um, um, affect intensity. So you can actually see the, um, the subjective loudness is very dependent on pressure, but also frequency, but also where in the spectrum it is, the duration or the, the spectrum distribution, the duration, the envelope. Um, you can see your perception of pitch is weakly dependent on all these things as well. Camber, how we perceive the breakdown of the spectrum, obviously the spectrum matters a lot, but the envelope, if you ever played with a um, like a synthesizer and change the envelope, can make a big difference uh, to whether something is perceived as like a clarinet or a bell. Um, uh, same with the frequency, and then finally with the duration. So you can see uh, psychoacoustically, all these different things, and if you've played with synthesizers or sound software, you probably have already figured this out, um, all subjectively affect how loud something sounds, how high frequency it sounds. Um, so I mentioned earlier, everything that we know about light or any other type of wave applies to sound. So reflection you probably know is an echo. So this is a good example of an echo. Um, so refraction, um, so uh, sound uh, is able to refract. We already talked about um, um, a, a little bit that you know you can encounter sound. We also uh, refracting just like light. And we also talked about in this case that the exact speed of sound is dependent on um, is the, dependent on the temperature, just like the speed of light might be different in um, different parts of a material, and that can cause refraction. Uh, or an interface between two different speeds of sound or speeds of light, um, and so um, relative speed of light um, in materials. And um, so this can cause uh, sound to refract. Uh, diffraction, where you have a small occlusion that re-emits the sound as a point source or that allows it to go around an edge, we saw already impacts uh, binaural hearing. Um, also remember we talked about earlier, for a bigger sound wave, like that's the size of a room, Sound can diffract around corners. It can it can be easy to hear someone uh, around a corner. If you're ever like in the in the next room over, try playing a high pitch sound or a low pitch sound and see which one's easier for you to hear. It's actually very hard to hear a a, a high pitch sound even if the doorway is open. But uh, because uh, high, uh, these low pitches perceive the sound as almost like a point hole, uh, it's able to completely diffract back into a point source when it goes through that hole. Um, interference, so just like light, uh, you can have two waves that can either constructively or destructively interfere. So if you haven't heard of that before, constructive interference, and you have two similar waves where the peaks line up and the troughs line up, you have a bigger wave. And destructive interference is the opposite. That's the principle behind things like noise canceling headphones. So, um, you know, like ear pods or any other noise canceling headphones, they have microphones that they're using to generate an additional sound that is essentially the uh, the same sound that it's hearing, but with a phase of 180. Um, so dispersion, does anyone know what dispersion is for light or in general for a wave? 
yeah, different speed frequencies travel different speeds. So how about that sound? Does anyone want to guess? Star Wars? Like Star Wars. So there's these cables. So that's dispersion. The Doppler effect is when I think everyone knows this one. Uh, reverb. So reverb is when the transfer function of the space accumulates lots of reflections. And so this is a reverb room, and then she's going to move to an anechoic chamber. So the reverb room is designed to be extremely reverberant. There's lots of surfaces that, uh, that reflect the wave um, and distort the phase or pitch. And then the, the second anechoic chamber is meant to have basically none. Um, so room acoustics um, often are essentially a management of mostly reverberation and also signal to noise. So when you're designing a room, um, the most common things you're adding are absorbers, diffusers, and bass traps. And these are all just basically surfaces that have different coefficients of absorption or coefficients of reflection, you know, which is one minus the other. Um, and the idea is that different materials either absorb sound efficiently at a certain frequency or don't. So in this room, for instance, we have um, absorption panels here that absorb um, mostly high and mid frequencies. And then these bass traps in the corner are better at absorbing uh, low frequencies. And all of them are designed to make, you know, and also, you know, all the fabric in this room have made this room so that it's actually acoustically usable. Um, and that's a very deep field that's got a lot of interesting stuff. All right, mic microphones and recording. Um, so ultimately when we are analyzing voice at grid space or if you're building a model, it came from a microphone probably most likely, unless you use synthesized. And um, so it's really important to understand that microphones are not all the same. They're actually really, really different. And you encounter, like, there's a lot of different microphones you encounter in day-to-day -day life. Uh, first things first, a sensor, like the word sensor, is typically a chain of something called a transducer, which just is a fancy word for something that changes one form of energy into another form of energy. So a microphone is typically a transducer from pressure to electric, electrical signal most frequently. Uh, but actually, like it's commonly got several transducers in a row before you eventually get to an electric signal. Um, there's a lot of different types of pressure, gauge pressure, which is basically pressure re relative to ambient pressure. So like tire pressure, 35 uh, PSI relative to air pressure. Absolute pressure is typically against vacuum. Um, so um, like when we when we cite air pressure, that's that's typically absolute. Differential pressure is the pressure between two special points. Um, so just uh, you know, point A and point B, what's the differential pressure? It's often used in flow valves. Uh, it's using what's called a pitot tube in an airplane, which is used to measure uh, airspeed. Uh, vacuum pressure is typically a negative pressure where you have brought down the pressure in like a vacuum chamber and you want to measure it relative to ambient. So like often units like tor are used for vacuum pressure. Um, and uh, there's also um, Oh yeah, so different types of pressure sensors. Uh, so you can measure uh, pressure pressure using um, uh, uh, different um, uh, forms of bellows. Uh, and you can also measure it through an inductive uh, sensor where you have a coil of wire. You can measure it capacitively where you have, you know, basically a capacitor where the plates of a capacitor or the material in a capacitor change. Or you can measure it piezoelectrically where you have like a crystal of like quartz or another piezoelectric material where if you compress it, it generates an electric uh, charge. Or you can measure strain, which is materials where when you strain them, they generate electrical signals. And that kind of leads you directly to, oh, there's also variable reluctance sensors, which make use of a diaphragm to connect to a magnetic circuit, uh, which changes the re uh, reluctance of the circuit. So here are the types of the most common types of microphones. There's others that I won't get into. 
but these are the ones that you're gonna encounter, I think, at grid space or building a model. Uh, so crystal microphones are pretty rare nowadays, except in like kids' toys. Um, they're really, really cheap. They're called crystal because they're basically just piezoelectric simple recorders. They, 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 they also double as speakers and the piezoelectric speakers are pretty much the same device. Um, and um, here's actually one, this is an old one that we have in our 1960s room. You actually see it says crystal above the, um, above the, the microphone. And they're not really common anymore. They, they, they were popular because they were cheap and they were just building microphones for the first time. Um, dynamic microphones, these are kind of the go-to microphones if you're building a PA system. They, um, uh, they're called dynamic because they require power. They're also called coil microphones because they're powering a coil of wire, which is moving, that's attached to a membrane, which then is moving over a magnet like a generator. And so, hello, this is a dynamic microphone that's kind of, uh, they're really robust because they have these big, heavy magnetic coils instead of thin little membranes. Um, and they're also really low sensitivity, which sounds like a bad thing, but actually can be really good if you're trying to record someone playing a guitar, but you don't want the guitarist next to them being picked up, uh, which is common in like music situations. And they're also um, low distortion. Uh, they're really, really linear, and it's partly because they're low sensitivity. And um, so the next type is a condenser. They're a little better. They sound a little bit better. Condenser is an old timey way to say capacitor. They have two plates, one of which either is a membrane or is attached to a membrane. And as the membrane vibrates, uh, they uh, change the capacitance of that system. So like my blue microphone here uh, has, uh, it has an array of three condenser microphones. Um, they have higher frequency response because they have a lighter mass that can move in. Um, and they typically are powered because you need to electrify the capacitor so you can measure its capacitance. Um, Electric condenser microphones, um, probably most of your life, this is the, the most common type of microphone you encounter. Uh, most like cell phones for many years had this type of microphone. Uh, this lapel microphone is that type of microphone. Uh, they became popular because you can make them really small. So the idea is they work like condenser microphones, but instead of having these two little fragile plates, one side is actually replaced with a material called an electret, which is, is a material with baked in polarization, which allows it to act like a permanently charged capacitor. So they need less power. Uh, they're a little more robust, they're cheap. Um, and for a long time, they were kind of the go-to uh, microphones and devices replacing piezoelectric um, and crystal mics um, until we'll get to it in a second. Uh, ribbon microphones, I do not own one, um, but they respond to velocity, not pressure. If you think about like really, like think of a recording studio and microphone that looks like this, even today, they're really specialized microphones. They're popular in early radio. They're incredibly fragile because this is little ribbon. Um, and they, but they actually have the frequency response closest to the human ear. So there's like singers that like to, like to use them. And so you go to a fancy recording studio, they might have one. Uh, this is actually increasingly the most common type of microphone that you encounter. So um, I don't know where my phone is, but. Oh, it is. Uh, but uh, most of the microphones, there's multiple microphones in this, are MEMS microphones. Uh, MEMS means microelectrical mechanical systems. Uh, that is just basically a mechanical system that's been etched on the silicon like a chip. And so you can actually build a lot of other types of microphones. And so most commonly you're encountering MEMS microphones that behave like condenser or electric condenser microphones, where by embossing that the right shape and the right material properties onto a solid state device, you can make a zillion of these and they are very, you know, dependable. They're good, very good microphones um, just because they're cheap and you can buy a billion off of them off of DigiKey. Does not mean they're not really good microphones. I would say at GridSpace, because we operate with phone calls, the most common type of microphone we are encountering is a MEMS microphone, which very flat frequency, frequency response, very low uh, um, uh, noise. So they're good devices. Pickup patterns, so different types of microphones uh, that I just talked about or that exist in general have different shapes. They're typically represented in polar coordinates where it's 360 degrees of a circle and the intensity is how far it is. So these little nodes are dead zones. So, um, so omnidirectional equal responses in every direction. Uh, you have a cardioid. Um, you can actually see on this microphone on the back, there's a selector and they have the little polar patterns here. I can select between cardioid, omnidirectional, uh, uh, figure eight, and uh, they also have, um, they have, I don't know, a pattern that's like a figure eight turned by 90 degrees. And uh, the way they do that actually is it's a phased array of three condensers. Um, 
Uh, but yeah, it's important actually, if you're looking at a microphone to understand its signal to noise, its gain requirements, its frequency response, and its and its pulled pickup pattern. And that's generally what ends up determining whether a microphone is good for use case. Um, a couple other microphone properties that aren't as important to you probably, microphone impedance. So microphones, a lot of these are resistive devices. And if you wanna have a good transfer between them and their electrical device, you normally need to have impedance matching. Um, uh, microphone sensitivity, so there's both a volume, or so voltage and power sensitivity. Um, so um, uh, in general, when people are talking about the sensitivity of a microphone, most frequently they're talking about um, how, how sensitive it is to uh, acoustic energy. So amplifiers, uh, so that's an amplifier there that I turned on earlier with the guitar. Um, generally, if you are listening to a recorded sound, it is not just coming directly out of like a, a analog to digital or a digital, digital to analog converter. Um, and if you are um, playing a sound that comes directly from a microphone to a speaker, like a guitar, um, you are also probably amplifying the signal before you ever listen to it, because it is way too minute to ever drive a big speaker. And but the trade-off is by adding amplifier stages, including when you um, uh, play back a sound, you are adding um, you're adding noise, which is typically uh, expressed uh, in the signal noise ratio as decibels. And you also have some gain, which is the ratio of the intensity on the output versus the input, also in decibels. Distortion. There are tons of types of distortion, a lot of which affect grid space all the time. Again, we mostly operate on telephony, which is mostly digitized telephony, so we can encounter clipping. Uh, so there's digital clipping, and then there's uh, there's um, analog clipping. So analog clipping um, is a little softer. So if you remember, this is what my guitar sounds like. But with uh, an overdriven. Uh, it distorts the signal which then adds harmonics because it turns what's a soft sinus signal, soidal signal into something that starts to resemble a square wave, which has more harmonics. Um, that's a form of clipping, but there's also digital clipping, which we encounter in digitized audio all the time. Intermodulation distortion, when two tones of different frequencies cause distortion, transient distortion, where you have a really rapidly changing signal. There's a bunch of other types, and I'm not gonna get into them, but they're all really interesting. All right, last couple slides are on human voice. Um, I realize that I guess this is the main talk about um, phonetics, but I'm guessing wonky you'll cover some when you talk about speech recognition too. So this is kind of a crash course. This is the mouth. Um, basically, we generate sound in a lot of different ways, actually. Um, and in, in um, phonetics and phonology, you often refer to those as phones and phonemes. Uh, you can click, you can make like, gasps of air, like uh, like hisses from different parts of your mouth. Uh, and you can also uh, have vocal cords. And some sounds you make use them, and some sounds you make don't use them. And those are called um, voiced or unvoiced sounds. Um, the larynx and the vocal cords um, are used to generate uh, all the vowels and all the voice consonants, uh, which are most, uh, most loudly what you hear when someone Here's how the most voice sound. I'm just jump a little here. It's kind of gross. Jump the music it makes it even worse. But this is uh this is what how the vocal cords work. Basically, it is a column of air with uh two um two vibrators that kind of act like uh the reeds on a on a reeded instrument. And um so this is how they vibrate and that vibrates the column of air in your throat. And um, the size of the column of air determines the frequency and you have some control over that. Um, so different vowels um, manipulate um, the uh, where in the, uh, in the mouth the sound is being generated. So you can see near versus back and close versus open. So like, you know, um, a very open sound might be like, ah, a very close sound might be like, ooh, or you. Um, so that's closed versus open, and then um, uh, open, ver or sorry, uh, front versus back might be like ah uh, versus eh. Uh, um, and so those determine the different uh, vowel bones that you encounter with primarily those two dimensions, although there are other ways that they can be modulated, like by R's and L's. Um, the consonants 
are uh, divided into categories based on how they produce sounds and whether they are voiced or unvoiced. So if there's like a, a buildup of pressure and then it explodes, it's called a plosive. So like P, like P or D, um, where you build up pressure and then it makes sound. Um, if it's if, if if it's a hissing sound made in different parts of your mouth, it's called a frictive. And depending on where in the mouth you're making the explosion or the hissing, uh, that that'll affect uh, which part of the like so whether it's like a dental or whatever uh, uh, consonant. And and basically that creates the um, taxonomy of consonant phones. And then there's other specialized phones that are weirder, like the American R, where you curl up your tongue into a little like. I don't know, like crunched up thing uh, is a really weird phoneme. And then there are other ones, like I said, like popping sounds and clicking sounds um, uh, that that also um, affect things. And then finally, they can be voiced or unvoiced. So for example, um, and we'll see this in the challenge question, um, uh, we could have uh, S, which is just a uh, frictive sound that's unvoiced. But if I start voicing it, it becomes Z. And you can tell that by touching your throat. So now if I voice it, zzz, it's the same frictive, but with, with my vocal cords involved. All right, that's it. So that brings me to exercises for next time. I think Phoebe will reveal these answers, I hope. Um, so three challenge questions. In, uh, challenge questions. The first one, a vuvuzela produces 116 decibels of sound at one meter. How far is it away a soccer field away? And how loud would it be if you had 20,000 people playing it also at that distance uh, in decibels? Are the Vuvuzelas evenly distributed around? They're in a perfect sphere around you at one soccer field length, which I have no long idea how long that is. I didn't bother to check. Second question, uh, challenge question for next time. In the trenches of World War I on September 28th, 1915, the German artillery in Belgium could be heard more than 60 miles per, uh, away. However, they could not be heard between 30 and 60 miles away. Why was that? No question. Yeah. Is it a different answer if you're in or outside the trench? Uh, no, it's not. It has nothing to do with being in a trench, but there's a dead zone of 30 to 60 miles where they could not hear the artillery, but further away they could. Um, and a clue is that it was a, a warm summer afternoon, or technically fall. It sounds like artillery. Yeah. <laughs> All right, last question. Voice consonants are using the vocal cords. So I just covered z versus s. So those um, are the voice and unvoiced version of the alveolar frictive. Um, and um, so now I'm asking, okay, so uh, the palato alveolar frictive as in ship, what, what is, or how would you write the voiced equivalent? So these are the three exercises for next time. Um, I think we're also gonna be sending out the, um, uh, the first week programming assignments for the remote people uh, today. I think that'll come from Phoebe. And that's it. So thanks, everybody. So the next lecture will be from Phoebe about digital signal processing uh, and information theory, which is in two days. Uh, did anyone have any questions? Anyone remote? I have a question. When you showed us that video of the Laptop guitar being playing at 60 FPS. Mm -hmm. uh, were those wiggles in artifact camera? Or? They were aliasing the artifacts, yeah. But it's actually, I mean, in general, like uh, like spot or sh what are they called? Strobe lights are often used to, vi to visualize vibrating systems that vibrate too fast for the eye anyway. So it's actually like a really common way to, uh, to visualize the vibrating system. So it's use useful. Same experience where I actually wiggling. Do, do any of the remote people have any questions? Let me see. No? All right. Well, thanks, everybody. I'll see you guys in two days. This one, um, get it over there. Yeah, it's like